I want to talk about the theology of Babylon. Okay. Let me start when I already read this in verse in verse five. It says, "Upon her forehead, Revelation seventeen five. Upon her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. The mother is the one that gives life to something. Yes. So it is saying right that that the harlotry and harlotry." When God speaks of adultery in the Bible, yes, there is a natural adultery. But if we are the bride of Christ, he is talking about us cheating on Jesus. That's harlotry. This, the theology of Babylon can be summed up in four statements. Okay. Salvation by works. Yes. The centrality of the building. Mm -hmm. The authority of the builders and misdirected worship. Mm. That is the theology of Babylon. Okay? Remember, confusion reigns when you listen to two voices speaking at the same time. The theology of confusion was first preached in the garden yes. to the woman who was a willing listener. The serpent called God's word into question, calling it a lie. He said, the serpent said to Eve, who was the, only the woman at the time, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. That serpent was saying to the woman, If you disobey God, you'll be like him. Now, that's, that's a sermon straight from the heart of Satan. He believed that he could make himself like the Most High God. Isaiah 14, 14 is speaking allegorically of Satan when it says, I will make myself like the Most High God. Right? His dark heart was filled with a lie, and out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth spoke. The gospel of the enemy was then, always has been, and will be, to, it'll continue to be until Jesus returns, a gospel of works. You get to heaven by what you do, by what you do, not by what Jesus did. Right. One of the most scary, if that's the right word, verses in all scripture is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus says, many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did. Look what I did. Look at my works. I, I cast out demons. I prophesied. I did all that. And, and Jesus says to them, Depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. If you come into the presence at the, at the close of your life, and the first thing you want to say is, Hey, look at my works. You have never known him, and he has never known you. Ephesians 2. I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. And talking about God. And God raised us up with him, Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast." And that is where? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So, the idea that you can do something to earn your way into heaven is insane. It really is that simple. Whether it comes dressed in Babylonian robes or Persian splendor, through Greek philosophy, or through the Roman Empire, it is the grand lie. It proclaims that you don't need Jesus. On a hill, far away, stood an old ruby cross, a symbol of suffering and shame. And 